<laughs> so yeah, good morning, everybody. Um, some of you may remember me. I'm Dr. Patricia Solis. I am an Associate Research Professor of Geography at the School of Geographical Sciences and Urban Planning here at ASU, and I'm also the Executive Director of the Knowledge Exchange for Resilience. A few years ago, when I was at a different institution, um, I got together with some colleagues and with the United States Agency for International Development, and we launched a program called Youth Mappers, which uh, is more than a program at this point. I would actually call it a movement because it's just grown tremendously. We organize students at universities to contribute to OpenStreetMap, a platform kind of like Google Maps, but that is open and anyone can add to it. And we, we add data for humanitarian purposes in, in terms of disasters or um, any kind of effort and also for our own local projects and the projects that students want to do. A lot of our chapters are, you know, while they're based at universities, they like to work with local schools and, and sort of the pipelines of students and with community outreach, community organizations. So uh, we're very used to working sort of at that interface uh, and doing this work is really pretty easy. I've taught middle schoolers to do it. I've worked with um, an 89 year old World War II veteran to do it. And he did perfectly fine. So um, it's pretty easy. But now this movement ha has grown. I want to share with you my screen. Um, this movement has grown to be really a worldwide movement. We started at Texas Tech University where I was. Um, and George Washington University and uh, West Virginia University. And together we have uh, expanded to 212 campuses in 50 countries. You can see on our website if you want to know exactly where we're working and you can see all of the different places worldwide where there are youth mappers chapters. Some of them are a few people, a handful of people, and some of them are really hundreds of people. But uh, in all, we estimate about 5,000 uh, university students around the world are working together to help uh, create data for real humanitarian and development needs. So um, one of the things that I wanted to share with you is that uh, this activity, you can see we started in, we started actually in 2014, but really took off in, in 2015. But uh, we have this activity map where you could see not only where the students are, let me zoom out just a little bit, but where we work over time. And these are all of the, the places that youth mappers have added to OpenStreetMap, right? So if you know Craigslist, Craigslist used OpenStreetMap. Facebook, Facebook uses OpenStreetMap. Um, all over the world. Uh, with the Weather Channel, they use OpenStreetMap data. So the OpenStreetMap community is really a global community, not just us students, but every, anywhere, everywhere, practitioners worldwide that is trying to create this people's map of the world that you could think of as like the wiki map of the world. So that's what we've been working on today. We had our own little project in our own little corner of the world here in Arizona. You can see there's some edits here. Uh, and that's, you know, part of this bigger picture. Um, Last time that we talked, we talked about uh, that project in Maryville and mapping for solar communities. And today I wanted to talk to you about something about uh, that's happening on the other side of the world that is also about energy. And it's one of our featured projects right now. Um, and that is mapping power, uh, mostly located in Sierra Leone. We've had a couple of other um, uh, little minor projects in, in uh, West Africa as well, but mostly focused on Sierra Leone. And we see um, this project is really contributing to bringing electricity to rural communities, especially the sector there. Um, there's some actors that are funded by uh, USAID and the US Trade and Development Agency to um, do some mini grids to fill in some of those power distribution network needs. Sometimes the communities grow faster than the power uh, grid uh, expands to and then to design them you can't just start from scratch you got to know where those things are and there's always missing data there's missing buildings there's missing roads and then the the the, the uh, power grid itself is sometimes not anywhere on the map and so you can imagine how challenging that is for electrification planning um, for the Ministry of Energy and these other actors uh, to do it we also see this as a women's issue because having access to power is extremely important especially 
a lack of access to power is, uh, is, is exceptionally detrimental to women uh, who might have the labor burden of you know, cooking and cleaning and all of this without access to electricity. So, so getting electrification really um, supports their livelihoods and making their women's lives and girls' lives easier. So that's one of the things that um, we're putting together uh, with this Let Girls Map initiative. And maybe this can inspire some of your girls as well that um, we're paying attention to some of the needs around the world. So that's kind of the background. And you'll notice that the interface about mapping the project, at least the first step, is going to be pretty similar to what we've done before. Um, you'll see this Teach OSM uh, Teaching Tasking Manager interface. I can give you some of these links, but we have several of them if you go to our featured project and you can, you can check on some of these. Uh, and then you can see in here that we do a good description. You can um, share with your students about what the data is going to be used for and how we use it and why they're mapping buildings and roads. At this point, we're just asking beginners to map the buildings because they're the easiest. So it looks very similar uh, to what you've seen before. I picked a couple of uh, places to show you. Um, they're pretty small. Um, communities. I'll take this particular task. So you'll see that the tasks are um, quite, you know, quite um, cover a lot of uh, random areas here. But if you want to get the um, community built where a lot of the buildings are, then um, you can just choose one of them that has a, that sort of footprint behind it. Um, there are editors, as you remember, there are editors that you can choose to start mapping. You can use the ID editor, which it looks very familiar to you, but we've also enabled the, the rapid editor, which is, has some AI behind it. AI stands for artificial intelligence. That is the same technology actually that Facebook uses to, to do facial, facial detection features to tag you in your photos. Facebook and Microsoft actually developed this tool for the OpenStreetMap community to help detect where might buildings and roads be. It's really kind of hard to see uh, on this one. Uh, let me turn off a couple of the, of the um, layers here, the map feature layers, so that we're only looking at you know, roads and buildings so that it's um, a little bit easier. A little bit easier to see some of this stuff, but when the when the um, I the ID tool finds what it thinks is a road or a building, if it's enabled up here, you can see it in bright pink. And then what you can just do is say, "Is that a road?" Look at it and say, "Well, yeah, you know, it's actually partial road." So I can go ahead and and uh, tag this feature. Oops, I forgot to log in. I apologize. Hold on one second. I don't know why I'm not logged in. There we go. So it gives us a, a, a suggested tag and you could, uh, you know, use that tag. Uh, you could also just use sort of a unclassified road is what we typically use if we don't know what it is, if you're going to be doing the roads. There you go. Um, the other thing that we're going to want to do is check over this data. You can see the existing buildings are here in, you know, highlighted. Um, we typically don't ask new mappers to go and um, correct any of this data. You might see, like, you see there's like an overlap here. The person who created this didn't do a very good job, frankly. They didn't square up. You put right click and square up those those corners a little bit better, right? Uh, so they didn't do a very good job on that, but they're also probably using a different imagery that is offset. Um, this is a good chance to talk about uh, geometry and satellite images. If you've got different satellites that are going overhead and they might come at a different angle, you'll see very slight variations depending on which imagery you're using. So uh, if you run across this, which you probably will, I just suggest to people that they leave the ones that seem to be done alone and just start mapping the ones that aren't indicated. They might have also been using older imagery, you see, because they missed this house. Maybe this house is new. 
So to map the buildings, you pick your area tool and then you just outline the building. Square it up with your right click button. Find your building features, tag it as some kind of building. It's probably a house, but we don't know. So we're gonna be safe and not include that. Uh, you know, if we're working in a place, remember our last time we were working in our own hometown, so we could probably even do how many levels, the address, if you're from your neighborhood and you know the address, you could tag all sorts of things in this database. But when it's in a different part of the world, a different country, and ethically speaking, uh, you know, if we don't know, we're not going to put it on the map. Someone else can come in and add that, who knows? So we just check that checkbox and add that feature and then grab our tool and do it all over again until we have successfully reached the whole entire area. And again, don't worry if you're finding that, um, you know, there's some other things that don't look right. Let's just go past that and um, add the buildings that we do know, okay? Youth mappers, we're very concerned with um, quality. So we have our own validator team of, of uh, students and graduate students who are trained to look at these things and to um, uh, correct them and use some other tools to make sure that they are um, done properly. And so uh, your students won't have to worry about that. We do take care of the map in that way. We'll delete any kind of vandalism or anything like that. And if it has a youth mappers hashtag, it's really important that it's good quality, okay? So when, when uh, you've gone through the whole, uh, this is our, my square, right? This little highlighted area, when I've gone through all of that and captured all of the missing buildings, and of course I save every so often, you can see our hashtag up here, youth mappers. So it's, it's tagged with youth mappers. I hit upload, and then those changes are live on OpenStreetMap. So once I've done that and I've com complete the, completed that area, I can just go back to my, oops, I can just go back to my interface here on the tasking manager and mark as completely mapped. If I'm just stopping now because I got tired or I'm gonna come back to it, you can just hit stop mapping and that frees up that cell for someone else to do. You can see some of these haven't even been um, touched yet uh, by our team. So uh, you can check on the contributions by hitting that activity and you can see 0% map and 0% validated. We can look at, at some of the other um, projects in this, uh, you know, in this set. Here's one that is more complete. You can see here in that tasking manager mapped is in yellow. If we've already validated, that's in green. It looks like I've already locked this one. And then activity and stats, you can actually even see who has been working on this. So if you have the usernames of your students, you can go back and even see their contributions. And we can also, I've set up a grading system. And if anyone even wants to require this or grade for this, we've got stuff for you to help you do that, okay? So any, there's, there's several of these tasks and I can share all of them with you if you would like to be using this in another part of the world. Um, just to let you know, uh, uh, we do work with these people. This, this is Tommy here. He's our main contact there and a, a, a mentor to one of our chapters. We use Youth Mappers chapters in the places where we work. So we have that direct connection with the students and their peers. Uh, so there's a real human touch to this. We're not just randomly mapping on the map. We have some ethics behind this where we're always using the data for um, known projects and with um, our known collaborators. So before I move on to the next stage of what happens in this project, does anybody have any questions? Comments? Good so far? You think your students will like this? Yeah, okay, good. I hope they do. I hope they get inspired by it. And there's many, many other projects that, that we can work on and I'll show you one source to be able to get those. So I told you about that new tool, obviously the, the mapping tool, the, uh, the, the building mapping tool, the ID editor is, is familiar to you. The rapid 
the AI assisted, we call that augmented mapping because it's augmented by artificial intelligence. We didn't see a lot of it today just because the, 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 the system isn't picking it up, uh, but that's a new tool that it can excite your students. And then um, what you will also see uh, through this project, once we get those buildings and roads mapped, we have to map the actual electrical grid. So how do we do that? I want to show you a couple of other tools and uh, I can go into, into depth with some of them, uh, but I won't do a complete demonstration today. Oops, that's the verifier tool. I don't want the verifier right now. I use many of these. So there is this um, a resource called Mapillary. So you know how Google has the street level view. Mapillary is the same thing for OpenStreetMap and they're open photos. So uh, I can't demonstrate this completely for you because uh, you'll need your phone to, to do it. So you download the app on your phone, the Mapillary app, and then you can uh, mount that to your car or mount it to your bicycle and go through the street and do your street level views and then upload them here to Mapillary. Uh, there's uh, more than a billion street level images uh, around the world in this open format. It's pretty amazing. So what we're having our local Youth Mappers chapter there in Sierra Leone do is, as you'll see, they're mounting that, you see in this picture, that phone, Let's see, can I zoom in just a little bit so you can see this picture better? That phone mounted on their bicycles is taking that street level view. So we're uploading those. They are because they're there. We're not there. We could do this here too. Um, but we need that imagery there. And they're uploading that street level view so that we'll have a good street level imagery. So we'll have the buildings data, we'll know where the buildings all are, we'll know where the roads all are, and then we'll have all of these images that we can use, then use uh, to decide where are the utility poles. So we haven't done that processing yet because as you see, they're, they're actually just now, um, as of Thursday last week, able to go out again safely in the pandemic to go and take the street level pictures. So we're processing those right now. And then we're going to be using this tool called Pick for Review, which um, helps us understand uh, what we're looking at. That imagery goes through another machine learning AI process to, to identify where are the poles. And then we need human eyes to say, oh, that is or that's not. We really need that verification. So we're gonna be using this tool. I can't show you our mission because we don't have one yet, but I'll show you some of the other missions that your students could be involved in. And eventually our mission of the utility poles will look something like this. Um, all of these here are different mission types uh, to, to try to decide, for example, um, this is a good one, crossings using the wheelchair. Street crossings. We were talking about street crossings in, in our local uh, Maryvale project. So what you would do is uh, you use your same OpenStreetMap um, account and log in, and then you'll go through here, and then you'll look at these images one at a time, and then say, for example, is this crossing accessible using a wheelchair? Does that look like it? You've got a little magnification tool here. Does that look like that's accessible? It looks like there's a curve over here and then it does kind of taper off and it looks like, yes, that looks accessible. So you hit the yes and it'll update it directly in OpenStreetMap. Here you can see it again. It's sort of a different view. And you see this street level view is that same image that the person had been taking, their person had been taking and putting on Mapillary uh, to go through the street. So you'll see in our project, you'll see uh, tagged uh, utility poles and you say, yes, that's a utility pole or no, that's a palm tree, right? So you have several choices here and each of these update live in OpenStreetMap. This is a kind of fun one to do uh, if you wanted to um, contribute to any one of these, these open missions. Uh, so with that, we're going to have the electric grid that exists. We're going to have 
the building and the road data. And, and all of that is going to be used by our really super smart people over um, at the LEAPS lab. And they're going to design a brand new grid that will fit over the existing grid so we can expand the rural electrical access to everybody and um, hopefully really improve the lives of the whole community, especially the women and girls who are burdened with some of the added labor of cooking and cleaning. So those are some of the new tools. Um, Anything else I can go over or something else I can add for you? Something else you're looking for? Do you want some links? <laughs> I think Rebecca might. Definitely some links. Definitely some link. links. Yeah. I'll put the, okay, so here's the pick review in the chat window. Pick for, pick for review. Um, here's Mapillary. Uh, you will have to do the app, so you can't really, you know, look at it completely online. But it's pretty easy, right? You mount the mount the uh, photos, um, and then, of course, here is the link to our projects. And. Uh, if you wanted to just look at uh, where are all of the youth mappers projects that um, use AI, there is, uh, I'll share my screen again. This is that, the one I just put with you is the, is the map with AI tool website. So you can find anything that is, is, is going on, but we have a special link here for youth mappers for all of the, um, all of those that include AI, right? Uh, you can also go to the humanitarian open street map team, which is a larger team. I honestly don't recommend that your students get on some of these uh, if they're urgent or if they're um, um, if they're like critical because or like is a hurricane that just happened and we want you know people to map. Uh, without some kind of training and orientation, right? I wouldn't just give these links out because they they will be used probably in real time with not as much validation as what we do in some of our slower moving projects. Um, but you can certainly go, it looks very much the same, uh, this tasking manager. Uh, so it'll look pretty uh, familiar with you. But look for the ones you could say, um, mapping difficulty beginner, and that will help you sort of sort through which ones um, you could maybe work with your students on. Let me try to find one that hasn't been completely fully mapped. Here's one, just to take a look. Let's see if, if uh, any of these are a little bit more uh, a little bit more heavy on the AI detection. Some places, the satellite imagery is just not really good for the AI detection. That's why we still use our eyes. Okay, so this one you can see there's a lot more building, there's a lot more road detection going on. And so each one of these, you can just um, click on them and, and see where to go. So that's how you can get involved in any one of these projects. Almost all of these will have some kind of instructions uh, and an orientation about why they're doing it if um if you wanted to kind of use that as a tool for learning about other places in the world and what's happening in terms of development um okay so here's another tool it's called map swipe and uh you will have seen that um in our in, in some of the um, in some of the places that, that our task was, there was a lot of rural areas. And so like a lot of it won't even have any buildings anywhere. So you have to go through several different screens to see if there's any buildings to map. Well, this helps us do that a little bit faster. So it's also a, um, a, a phone based tool. 
uh, but then you just basically look at a series of images like it'll show this image and you say, yes, there's buildings on it. Uh, no, there's no buildings on it. And so that helps the rest of the mappers just focus in on the places where there is going to be something to map. And then we don't have to go through image after image after image to find any buildings. If you wanted to do like a big, huge area that had a lot of rural places in it. Um, I really like this YouTube video. It's kind of fun. I'm going to share it with you because yours, I don't know. I have teenage boys and sometimes they think that what I think is funny is not funny, but this one is I think this one is pretty funny because it's swipe right, swipe right, swipe right, ugh, swipe left, swipe left, right. So I know our YouTube fans are clamoring for us to make another episode of MapMet, but first I thought I'd tell you about a little project I've been working on. Uh -huh. It took quite a lot of blood, sweat and tears, but I think you'll be impressed. That's very interesting. I spent the last six weeks in South Sudan. It's the world's youngest country, you see, so very little of it has been mapped. So I thought I'd head out there with my ranging poles my trundle wheel, and uh, start to map the place. Really? I mean, obviously, it was quite a huge project for just one man to undertake. Ooh, swipe right on that. But at times, I did get pretty lonely. Really? And I did actually get very ill. It was really quite awful. Jay, I'm trying to tell an important and emotional story. Can you just leave it with the dating app for one moment? Finished. What? Papua New Guinea. What do you mean, finished Papua New Guinea? I've mapped it. Well, I helped. What are you talking about? Me and a whole bunch of mappers from around the world have been using a new app called MapSwipe. It helps humanitarian workers like MSF navigate unmapped parts of the world. So if there's an emergency, they can quickly identify where help's needed. Like in South Sudan? Exactly. When mapping large areas and much of it's uninhabited, skilled mappers can waste a huge amount of time scanning for settlements and roads. MapSwipe uses satellite imagery of countries like South Sudan and breaks it up into manageable chunks so people like you and me can easily identify which bits need mapping. Easy. So, so that's just a taste of it, I guess. Um, there's plenty of really fun things like that to do. I like the little approach to swiping and dating the dating app. So, Okay, what else? What else can I introduce you to or help you with? Michelle had a question in the chat, and I also wanted to oh. add a question, which is about like how long would you estimate it takes? Sorry, yeah. Go ahead and deal with that question. Ta answer that question. No, please go time. ahead. I'm listening. Um, uh, how long does it? Would you suggest that people take to or plan to take in training, say, junior high age kids on so so that they're able to kind of get started and do the basic program? Um, I would say that you could do it in just a couple of sessions with them. Uh, what I would like to do to set up new mappers is, um, well, typically at the university, I'll have some help because I'll have some experienced mappers first. So you could kind of generate some student helpers that could help the other ones as well, which is always fun. But even absent that, uh, you know, the first introductory session, I would definitely give them the background about what you're doing. Um, I did a study with my students at Texas Tech, and there, I, I, I was kind of a psychological experiment on them of sorts. Uh, half of the group, I told them why we were doing it, and the other half, I just taught them how to do it, right? And I compared the performances and the differences between the two of them. Uh, now, they didn't necessarily map better. And in fact, they made different kinds of mistakes, but they actually had a higher satisfaction. They were more willing to learn. And there was a battery of empathy questions. The students who didn't know why they were mapping actually went down in empathy. They were kind of grumpy about learning something new without knowing why. And the ones who knew why, they were just really pleased with this. So definitely start out with the purpose and the sort of a context about what we're mapping, why, talk about youth mappers, um, maybe show them some videos and get their heads around that and say, you know, sometimes the students actually, they live in such high tech worlds, even students without a whole lot of digital access in the US cannot believe that there are people in the world that their places aren't mapped somewhere. We use Google Maps all the time. They can't fathom the idea that there are unmapped places in the world. So it's a really great teaching opportunity to do the context. Okay, so, after you know that orientation first, then I will give them demonstration so that they can see it done. And then I will release them to some of the tasks. Now, some of them are pretty quick and then they'll look at the URL and they'll get there before I do. 
<laughs> but uh, I always have them create their OSM usernames and give them to me so that after that first session, no matter how fast ahead they're going to get, there's always those ones, you know, um, then I can always check on them. And then we come back in between that first session and the second session. First, I'll introduce them to the buildings because those are the easiest. And I'll tell them not to do roads, but then there's always people doing roads and doing other things. Uh, but then with the OSM username, you can always go look at them and I can, I can share with you some, some uh, tools to like look and see where, you know, what, um, how we do grading and how we check on other students, right? Um, and then I'll check to see how well they're doing and I might reach out to some of them in that in-between time to say, look, you, you missed the step about squaring it up every time. They need to look nice. Or uh, which imagery were you using because they all look a little bit off? Or you know, you're, you're, peg you're pegging the buildings together. Those are some common mistakes that you can just in the meantime get with them. And then we'll have another session uh, kind of review progress, have a look at what everybody's done. Uh, if you're mapping a particular area, you can show the stats, you know, that stats page on however all the contributors, it's very open and their contributions are out there for everyone to see. Um, so, so then we kind of review that, talk about the common mistakes, and then we go in at another round and maybe I can introduce some of these other new tools. Um, and so that's, that's when I really feel comfortable um, getting everyone up to a minimum level. Now I've used this in classes for service learning classes and I've had grading. So I'll have a certain date by which they have to do a minimum number of edits so that then I can at least have enough to validate and see how well they're all doing. And then we can all move forward together. Um, that, so I would say at least a couple of sessions. And then if you really find that for some reason they're just not doing well, then you can slow things down. But, uh, you know, kind of that, that structured process of onboarding them is, is going to uh, help you down the road to not have to catch and correct a whole bunch of edits if somebody just goes wild and they didn't get, you know, proper training. Uh, I talk about the ethics as well. I think it's really important to introduce that to them at the beginning about why we map, where we map, and that we don't, it's a really powerful thing, and we don't add things that are not true. We don't put graffiti. We don't de delete other people's edits. Um, it's a community and not just this little technology that who knows, it's really connected to real human beings. And, and once you emphasize that, I think they take a lot of uh, pride and care into the work that they're doing. Okay, so uh, how about many of, your, how many of your projects deal with energy issues? Are any projects looking at agricultural food crops? So I would say we've had maybe a hundred different projects from youth mappers over the years. And so it's really hard for me to assess exactly how many of which types, but there have been, it's been only recently that we're getting into this electrification question, just because it's so hard to map those utility poles and map the grid. It's not very visible on the imagery. Um, our an analysts are actually also using nighttime satellite imagery to pull out some likelihood of where the grids might be so that we actually, I didn't talk about that part because it doesn't use volunteers because um, it's kind of specialized, but you can uh, you know, kind of predict where some of the likelihood of those uh, poles, the, the grid actually is once you can get those poles in place, right? Um, they'll follow the streets and they'll follow the settlements and they'll, they'll follow the nighttime lights, uh, satellite imagery by night. So uh, we put all that stuff together. Um, it's just really kind of new technology being able to do that stuff for the energy grid. Uh, so those have just come along a lot more recently, I would say in the last nine months or so to a year. Um, previously, yes, we absolutely looked at agriculture and food crops. We looked at, we've, from the very beginning, we looked at food security as one really interesting aspect because let's face it, if you're going to be looking at satellite imagery, whatever the feature of interest is needs to be visible. So not everything lends itself to remote mapping. Everything does lend itself to mapping if you have enough data, but not everything lends itself to visible mapping, right? So um, we've mapped uh, agricultural fields. You can't always tell what they are, but at least putting those features on the map are important. We worked with uh, the USAID 
food security team to, to add some data in Bangladesh. They wanted to know where were these, um, and I forget what they're called, but they were these little ponds that uh, women would grow shrimp in and uh, to sort of augment the food supply. And so they wanted to have a good sense of where they were and use that to detect where there was stunting of, of growth because of lack of nutrition. So that was sort of a baseline data to be able to make some analytics and comparisons uh, of, of where those things were. So yeah, all sorts of application in agriculture and food crops because it's visible. Um, the question is, do local teachers train new mappers or do they participate in a workshop through ASU? Uh, this is one of the things that we're trying to do to sort of disseminate the ability to use these tools. So you should feel free to um, train to the, your ability. Uh, you know, you could definitely consult with us and our Youth Mappers chapter if you end up having sticky points or questions. Um, you know, that we'd love to uh, multiply ourselves, really. That's how we do it. Uh, you know, we don't have to always be the ones training when you get up to speed on things. But uh, we also know that, uh, you know, you have certain comfort levels with, you know, how much you're learning. We're also still learning all the time. The tools change all the time. This AI stuff that I showed you is new. We were, last July, we were testing it. Our Youth Mappers chapters were testing it for Facebook. So that's how new some of this stuff is. So it's always changing. You always need to update these things. So uh, as long as you, you do, do your due diligence, I think there's a um, you know, sort of professional ethics of, of, of sharing, uh, but then getting that word out there and sort of replicating that opportunity to be able to contribute, sort of balancing that. Uh, our Youth Mappers chapter, they're not so active in the summer. They're gonna be coming back to campus well, maybe in person, but for sure virtually, they'll be coming back back to campus uh, at, in August. And they are they typically do one or two events every semester. And we really like to do the outreach to the high school groups. I'm the local advisor as well as being in charge of this global network. Um, I do mentor our local chapter. And um, there's probably, I don't know the official number of members, but maybe seven or eight students who are super active in it and they are more than willing to you know help fill in some of these training needs uh through a workshop perhaps or uh you know helping you find some online digital training materials as well um the best contact email if you need support you can send it to me and i can pass on to i'll type it in here uh, for, for local kinds of things, we also have a general info at youthmappers.org. Um, there, we have a lot of partners that really are interested in teachers. Our American Geographical Society, in fact, ha has a teacher's uh, retreat that we've done for the last two Novembers uh, for geography. It's, it's uh, typically for AP geography teachers, and I'm not really 100% sure on the eligibility for that, but a lot of our partners are really interested in, in, in um, making sure that uh, secondary school access to this is, is also um, well organized, even if, uh, you, know, um, uh, you know, it's at a distance or virtual these days, right? Okay. Thank you so much, Patricia. This is very, very helpful. We appreciate your time and I am sure we will be contacting you as we can. I would love to hear how you do em employ it if you do. And, um, you know, feel free to excerpt some of these demos that I've done for you. You'll have access to those recordings, the, the first Sparky and then this modified Sparky session. Um, and again, there's plenty of of, uh, well, not just the fun videos like the one I started showing you, but also some training stuff on, on YouTube. Uh, we have a youth, youth Mappers YouTube uh, channel where we've collected some of those. So you can see what Youth Mappers are up to. You can show some of that. You can read our blog. We'll try to help connect you to things that you can use in your classroom. And I'm just really curious, like how that works out and what you're finding and, um, how if any of your students decide they want to go major in geography at ASU. <laughs> so okay, curious to see how it works for you.
Thank you so much. Okay, good luck then. All right, and I will look for the recording and I will see you next week, I'm sure. Yeah, we really appreciate all you are doing. I know it's a really disruptive year and everyone is just doing double time, trying to make things work and being creative for our kiddos and just really appreciate you. So know that we're behind you. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.